She lives life facing backwards, spends all of her time in her scrapbook with faded photos and fuzzy memories. He spends his life facing backwards, still reliving that high school championship decades ago. While some people dwell on past victories, others can't move past their distant past defeats. They regret a wrong career move, a broken marriage, not having children, poor choices, and their motto in life seems to be, if only. What do you do when the past paralyzes you? We all have a past, but we must not let our past paralyze us. In Exodus chapter 14, the nation of Israel was putting its past behind it, leaving slavery behind, leaving Egypt behind. When Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? You see, they're stuck in the past. They want to go back to Egypt. And then verse 12, they continue, Is this not what we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand still in the present, and see the salvation of the Lord in the future, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. He says, the Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. That's what God says to us today. Go forward. We can't live facing backward. All of us are going through time in the same direction, from the present to the future, moving forward. If you have a glorious past that you love to dwell on, if you have a painful past that you can't get over, the advice from God is the same. Go forward. Here's what to do to put the past behind you. Four things that you can do to put the past behind you. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff Hartman, First Baptist Church of Troy, North Carolina. And tonight we study how to put the past behind us. The truth is, most people cannot deal with the present or the future because they have never honestly dealt with the past. Do you want to live in the present and move into the future? Then you must learn how to deal with the past. How do you deal with the past, you ask? I'm glad you asked. Here are four things you must do. First, you must remember the past. Well, wait a minute, you say. I thought we were supposed to forget the past, to move on. Well. In order to deal with the past, you must actually face it. To put the past behind you, first you must face it. That means we have to remember it honestly and courageously. That means we must remember what happened to us, what God has done for us, what we have done. In the Bible, in Deuteronomy, at the end of their 40-year trek through the wilderness, they are now seeing Egypt in the rearview mirror. But here God says in Deuteronomy 5.15, Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Look at the first word, remember. A few verses later, Chapter 15, verse 15, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you to do this thing, to remember. 
God commands them to remember, you used to be a slave. Now you're free, but don't forget, you used to be a slave. The next chapter, Deuteronomy 16, 12, you shall, a third time, remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. A fourth time, Deuteronomy 24, 18, but you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you, again, remembering is a command. I command you to do this thing. One more time, same chapter, a few verses later, Deuteronomy 24, 22. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. Did I mention to you that you should remember your past? Five times. If God says something once, we need to pay attention. If he says it twice, we better stop what we're doing and listen carefully. But when he says it five times, remember what you used to be. It's very important that we obey this command. Yes, the past is in the rearview mirror for them. But I want to use the image of a rearview mirror as a way of putting in perspective the way we're supposed to use the past. I would like for you to use the past as you would a rearview mirror. Almost every day you get in a car, right? One of the things you have to do is adjust your rearview mirror and occasionally use your rearview mirror to see what is behind you in your past. Now you cannot focus on the rearview mirror. If you drive forward, looking backward in the rearview mirror, what's going to happen? Tragedy. You're going to hit something in front of you. You cannot spend your life looking at the past because we're all headed into the future. We need to look out through the windshield at where we're going. We need to see where we are. But it is good to have a perspective of where we've been so we can occasionally check back and see what's behind us. That's what God wants us to do with the past. He wants us to put the past in our past. We have to check it occasionally to remember where we've been, how far God has brought us. You remember Noah leaving behind the ark in Genesis chapter 8? God told him, go out of the ark, bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you. I want you to abound on the earth, be fruitful and multiply on the earth, but what you have to do is leave the past, but bring some things with you. We move forward, but we bring the past with us. So he's going out of the ark, but I want you to bring animals out, I want you to bring your suitcases out. There are certain things we leave behind, but there are certain things we don't. We remember where God has brought us from, which makes us full of gratitude rather than full of regret. And so the first thing we need to do to deal with the past is to remember it. We can't deal with it if we don't remember it. Use the past like a rear view mirror. Bring along what you've learned. Don't forget the past, what you've learned. The second step in putting the past behind you is to deal with the past. You can't deal with the past until you have faced the past, until you've remembered the past. So how do we deal with the past? Well, first, we need to deal with guilt. We all have guilt for things that we have done in the past. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.15, This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. We're all sinners. We all have guilt in our past. And Paul remembers his past as Saul, and he remembers that he's not only a sinner, but that he was the chief of sinners. He remembers with it, he remembers what it was, but he also knows that God dealt with his past and forgave his sins. If you are carrying that guilt with you, Paul, you're not equipped to do what you do. As a matter of fact, all of us as sinners are trying to live with something that our bodies, that our minds, that our spirits were not equipped to handle. God made human beings in his image, and we're not equipped to handle guilt. We have to have it dealt with. And so the cross is God's way with dealing with our sinful past to get rid of guilt. You say, yeah, but you don't know what I've done. Yes, are you worse than 
Paul, who called himself the chief of sinners, why he was one who persecuted Christians and put them to death. You're doing worse than that. How about second? Dealing with the past by dealing with your sins, not your sin, your guilt, but your sins, individual sins, even after our sins are forgiven, we still, as followers of Christ, as Christians, sin. We still disobey the Lord. And so on a daily basis, what the Bible tells us to do is to deal with our sins one by one. It's one thing to say, Lord, forgive us for all of our sins. It's another thing to say, God, please forgive me for this sin that I committed just now and help me to turn from that sin. And so that's what 1 John 1, 9 is talking about. If we confess our sins, name them one by one, not your blessings, but your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. On a daily basis, I recommend you do what 1 John 1, 9 says. Recall the sins that you committed that day that alienate you from your heavenly Father and you name them one by one. It's not enough to say, forgive me for all my sins today. Lord, today I lied when my children were young and we made sure in disciplining them that they named their sins. They weren't allowed to say, I did a bad thing. They couldn't say, I didn't tell the truth. They had to say, I told a lie. And many times just naming the sin would break their heart and cause them to cry. When we say, Lord, not I, I sinned or I didn't do my best, but Lord, I lied. I broke my commitment to you, to my spouse. That is what he wants us to do, to make things right with him on an individual basis. The third thing we can do to deal with the past is to deal with offenses to others. This is what we call a clear conscience. After you've confessed your sin to the Lord and taken care of the vertical relationship, you have to take care of the horizontal relationship. What about the people that you have wronged? this day or in the past, we want to deal with them. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 23 and 24, if you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Take care of the vertical, yes, say, Lord, I sinned against you, but I also lied to or against my brother or sister. And so what we have to do is practice a clear conscience and make sure there's no one on earth who can accuse us of sin that we haven't confessed to them and made right. And here's how I recommend you make a clear conscience. You say three things. I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. Don't make excuses, don't belittle your sin, don't say I sin, but you sin too. Say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, Please forgive me. And then the fourth way we can deal with the past is by dealing with bitterness. Luke 6, 37, Jesus says, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. When you don't forgive, you not only hurt your brother, you much more hurt yourself because you deal with the bitterness. Put it past behind you and let it go. Forgive those, even if they haven't, they didn't say they were sorry. That's all right. Forgiveness is a gift that you give yourself. Don't carry that baggage around anymore. You've looked in the past and in the past, there are some painful hurts. Forgive them. There are some terrible mistakes, some terrible sins that you've committed. Make them right with God and make them right with your brother or sister. Because if you don't resolve it, if you don't deal with the past, you can never leave it behind and live in the present and go into the future. You see, to be a success in the future, you must be a success in the present. But to be a success in the present, you must put the past behind you. Resolve it. Deal with it. Because, because regret and unresolved guilt and bitterness not only are unproductive, but they are counterproductive. You have to leave it behind. There's an old Buddhist story about two monks who were lock, walking along the path when they came to a wide stream that was very difficult to pass. And there was a woman there who couldn't pass and she begged them 
to help her across. In spite of his vow to never touch a woman, the first, the older monk, picked her up, put her on his shoulders, and he walked her across and set her down, and then they continued on their way. The younger monk couldn't understand why his elder, his mentor, would break his vow. And so he thought about it and he wanted to say something, but he waited an hour and then two, and it was eating him alive. After four hours, he finally said, Sir, how in the world could you break your vow to never touch a woman and carry that woman across the stream? And the older monk said with a smile, Son, I put that woman down four hours ago. You're still carrying her. Sometimes we have to let it go, put it in the past, leave it behind us. So remember the past, number one. Deal with the past, number two. And then number three, oh, how important this one is. Learn from the past. The reason we look back in the first place is to learn from it. The past is not to be discarded. It has some real value. A prudent man, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3 says, A prudent, a wise man, foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. If you go through and you make the same mistake twice, that shows you haven't learned from the past. One of my favorite stories about learning from the past is the guy who was played a practical joke on. His friend said, here, I want you to do something for me. This is a really funny thing. Watch this. And so he said, what I want you to do is I want you to hit my hand as hard as you can. And so he put his hand up against a tree. And he said, when I say three, I want you to hit my hand as hard as you can. This is going to be funny. And so he said, one, two, three. And he pulled away his hand. And the guy hit the tree as hard as he could. He saw stars and his knuckles hurt. And he thought that was hilarious. He couldn't wait to pull that on his friend. So he went along his merry way. When he came across a friend, he said, Hey, I want to I wanna show you a great trick. And so he said, What I want you to do is I want you to hit my hand as hard as you can. And when I say three, you can hit my hand as hard as you can. He looked around and couldn't find a tree. So he put his hand in front of his face and said, one, two, and he pulled his hand away and he played a trick on himself. Here's a man who didn't learn from the past. As a matter of fact, if he did that a second time in front of his face, he would really not be a prudent man, right? You see, there is nothing wrong with making mistakes, but there is something terribly wrong with making the same mistake twice and three times and four times. Success is not making no mistakes. Success is not being afraid to fail, but learning from one's mistakes, that's how you learn to walk. Any one of us who can walk somewhere along the line had to fall, but we learn from those falls. We learn how to keep our balance. We learn to walk around objects in front of us, and that's the way we learn to walk is by falling. When Joshua gets the children of Israel into the promised land after Moses led them for 40 years through the wilderness. This is what the Lord said to him in Joshua chapter 8, verse 1. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his city and his land. And so, here's what they did. Lay an ambush for the city behind it. So Joshua rose and all the people of war to go up against Ai, Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them on their way. So they've got 30,000 men, which is 100 times what little Ai had. Verses 15 and 16, Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them. Remember what happened. They ran from Ai. They lost because of overconfidence. But now when he comes up the second time in verses 15 and 16, they didn't lay an ambush on them. What they did was they drew them out of the city. Joshua and Israel made as if they were beaten before them again and fled by the way of the wilderness. So all the people who were in Ai were gone together, together, pursued them, and they pursued Joshua and were drawn away from the city. And in verse 19, then those in ambush 
arose quickly out of their place, and they entered the city, the ones who were hiding, and they took it and hurried to set the city on fire. You see, this is the way that Joshua learned from his mistakes. So what we need to do is learn from our mistakes, learn from our past, and not repeat the mistakes of the past. What the man learned was to deal with his past and learn from the past. Finally, there is a fourth thing that we must do in order to put the past behind us, and it is now we are ready to forget the past. Remember the past, deal with the past, learn from the past, and then literally put the past behind you, forget. You can't live facing backwards. We can't live, we can't drive looking at the rearview mirror or we'll crash. So if you want to break the power of the past, you need to reach the fourth step, which is to finally forget the past. That's when we come to Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Paul says, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. That's not the one thing he does. But after he has forgot the past, then he reaches forward to those things which are ahead. When you're driving, it's not about what's behind you, but it's what is ahead of you. So the one thing he does is he reaches forward, but he has to forget the past to do that. I press toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What we need to do is we need to put the past behind us by driving into the future. What we see is that the good old days are usually a product of a bad old memory. Those who live in nostalgia are remembering the good and are filtering out the bad. We want to learn from the bad. We want to learn from the good. We can't live in the past like if you've seen Napoleon Dynamite, Uncle Rico spends all of his time reliving his glory days of 1982. You should know that the most recorded song in all of history is a song that says, I believe in yesterday. But that's not what we are supposed to, that's not how we are to live. Actually, Philippians chapter, or Psalm 118, 24 says, This is the day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. If you've got nostalgia filtering out the bad old memory, then the best thing about the good old days is that they are gone forever. The past is past. Now you have to put it in your past. I love the hymn that says it well, the old rugged cross. It says, my trophies at last I lay down. Are you ready to lay down the trophies? Are you ready to lay down the regrets? Lay them down. Because if you dwell on past failures, you will have many more in the future. If you dwell on past successes, you'll probably have none in the future. What are you going to do with your past? That will determine what you do in the present and what will happen to you in the future. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. If you let them, behold, all things have become new. Each new day is a gift from God. Each new day is a clean slate. As Marty McFly learned in Back to the Future, Tomorrow is a blank page. It hasn't been written yet. So you choose by leaving the past behind and living in the present. In Isaiah chapter 43, the people of Israel were saying to God, come on, Lord, do it again, what you used to do. And God replies, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Everyone knows what a child does when you do something funny. They say, ha, ah, do it again. You give them a ride on their knee, on your knee, and they want another one. Do it again, do it again. But what a parent wants to do is to teach their children new things, new fun things to do, new great things to learn. What we need to learn is that we're not asking God to go back to where he was in the Old Testament times, or in the New Testament times, or even in the good old days of the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. No, our church, your church, your life, God has, yes, done wonderful things in the past, 
but he's more focused on the present and the future now. Yes, our church, Troy First Baptist Church, has a glorious past, 136, 137 years of God's faithfulness to us. But our best days are ahead of us if we can put our past behind us. The best way we can have a glorious future is by putting the past behind us. And we honor our past by living fully in the present and looking toward and planning for the future. That's the same thing for you as an individual as it is for us. You see, the past can either empower you and as a ladder lift you up, or it can paralyze you and be an anchor to drag you down. The Northwest University Wildcats were one of the worst football teams in the Big Ten and in the NCAA. They had a record 34 losses in a row. But in 1995, miraculously, they went 10-2 and two and went to the Rose Bowl and came in number eight in the country. The coach, Gary Barnett, he was the coach of the year, but what he did was he took the trophy that they won for their Rose Bowl victory and he dumped it in the trash can the following season in training and said, that's it, it's gone. We can't live in the past. Are you willing to dump your past in the trash can? Yes, look at it, deal with it, learn from it, but are you willing to leave it behind? Are you willing to lay down your trophies? Are you willing to lay down your regrets? Are you willing to put them before the cross? Painful bitter memories, bitterness. My, I want to say, like we do in Old Rugged Cross, at last I lay them down. We started in Ephesians chapter 14. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. And that's what God is imploring you to do. That's what God is imploring me to do. That's what God is imploring us to do as a church. We need to move forward. It is time for us to learn what has become my life verse, Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm not going to glory in the past. I'm not going to regret the past. I'm going to put it behind me, and I'm going to live in the present so that I can have a great future with God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this lesson from your word on how to deal with the past. Some of us have to put behind us some glorious memories. Some of us have to put behind us some old regrets. Lord, help us to lay those down and to live fully in the present and face forward. For in Christ's name we pray, amen. We won't be on next week, but we'll see you in two weeks.